I'd like to speak to you tonight on a very important subject, very fundamental to being saved from our sins by Jesus, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. This will cause us to harken back some to what Ken taught us, and we were led in the study of the book of Hebrews some time back. But there's a marvelous, wonderful, we could call it a very radiant message found in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. And of course, it's informing us of the necessity of the shedding of blood if our sins or any man's sins is to be remitted. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no, well, there is no remission. It's a very simple statement, but it's full of meaning. As we consider right of Hebrews, and he was writing to Jews who were Christian, but were actually thinking about going back under that which the Lord meant to be a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. We are reminded of all the teachings in the law of Moses concerning animal sacrifice. In view of the fact that the blood of bulls and goats had been poured out by the hundreds of gallons for centuries, yet the writer of Hebrews makes it clear none of that blood could remit even one sin. And that's, of course, what's involved when he wrote the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 9.22. And that brings us then, as it were, face to face with the only genuine efficacy for all time. And that brings us to our subject again, the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I think as many songs have been set to music uh, regarding, I should say poems set to music regarding this thought and of course many others, the song writer who wrote the following words very cogently and beautifully set forth the truth of the matter when he said, yes, in the blood of Christ I see the gate that stands afar for me. So mankind cannot be redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, nor by, as the Bible says, vain tradition, pointless traditions, as well as customs, which, by, which have been inherited actually from our forefathers, especially that true of the Jews, it certainly can't be done by the machinery of false religion, such as Roman Catholicism or any man's religion. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 20, affirming what we believe most assuredly, for as much as ye know that ye were redeemed, not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, that's your vain, pointless way of life, received by tradition from your father, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Well, that was the truth, and, and Peter wrote it back in the days of the first century to the church. It's true of us today. We'll be to the end of time. In Colossians 1 and verse 20, we learn from Paul that the Savior provides peace through the blood of the cross. I think there are at least two we can look to, two memorable predictions from the Old Testament that find um, fulfillment when it comes to the shed blood of our Redeemer. And I would like to pause and speak of Redeemer. That means somebody that is buying you back. Uh, we're slaves to sin. We became sinners by our own choice, Romans 3.23. That separated us from God, Romans 6.23. We couldn't save ourselves. Nobody else could save us. No angel could save us. And by a pure law system, we're condemned, period. You sin, you die. Yet through the love and mercy and grace of God, a plan was made, and it involved the love of God, especially in the form of Christ who came to earth, as we've studied most often, 
save us. So notice Isaiah 1, for he's the great Messianic prophet, Isaiah 1, verse 18, and we'll also put Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1, and put these two verses together. Isaiah said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, and a fountain for cleansing and for sin shall be open. All of that was said hundreds of years before Jesus walked this earth. And when you study the prophecies of our Lord, uh, you see then there was great hope for the Jew who would properly write, the, that is, write and divide the word of truth as it was then the Old Testament, and especially the law of Moses. And we find in the book of Leviticus, which I think is a very powerful devotional book, and, of course, it takes its name from the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe. And in reading it, we find out all about what the priests were to do. And then all of the Levites who were not priests, because the priests came from the family of Aaron, Moses' brother. But we find out all their work in attending to the tabernacle and so forth. And we find out from Leviticus 17, verse 11, what was, should have been imprinted deeply on the minds of every Jew, the life is in the blood. Now you think about it for a moment. Paul said the law of Moses was a schoolmaster, a tutor. The Greek is a pedagogos. So usually it's an old slave who is signed only to get the children from the house safely to the school, the real place of learning. That's where the word comes from and how it was used. And that's the way the law of Moses was to be for the Jews. But, of course, they tried to see the end of all things in the law and in their ethnic uh, being, which it was not. They didn't understand it. But there were Jews who did. There were Jews who understood. They may have been very much the minority, but there were some who did. And when you look at John 19, verse 34, we see the record of the sadness of the death of Jesus. But that's where we learned that that fountain that was prophesied that we read about a moment ago, that that fountain was open for cleansing of men's sins on Golgotha's tree. The language of Romans 5 that Paul wrote, and he would thoroughly know about these sacrifices. Remember, he said, I was a, Hebrew of the Hebrews, I was a Pharisee, and so on. We couldn't get more in harmony with Judaism than Saul of Tarsus did. Yet he writes, as converted Paul the Apostle to the church in Rome, and it's a thrilling passage when he says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then he continues, much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now think about for a moment, if you'd been a Jew and really understanding the design and purpose of the law, the reason that the Israel existed, if you'd properly understood that, then you would have realized that every calf, every goat kid, every lamb, every pigeon, every dove, that the law of Moses required that you bring up to the tabernacle, then to the temple, bring it to the priest, and he kills it and offers it according to the law, sacrifice for you. Now here's what you would fully know. The right of Hebrews makes it clear. None of that blood would save you. None of it. Well, then why was it offered? It was to make them fully aware that they needed a Savior and nothing in this world could save them and that there had to be an innocent life 
offered on your behalf. Every time a Jew offered a lamb, now just think of that little lamb. It had to be the best out of the flock. If he wasn't a shepherd, he had to go buy the best lamb he could find. Couldn't be sick, couldn't be halt, couldn't be lame. Nothing like that. It had to be the best. It's the blue ribbon lamb at State Fair. So he had to go out there and he had to pick that little lamb. And you know how docile and sweet those things are. Same true of a little goat kid. And think of how peaceful and how they represent peace that doves and pigeons are. Totally innocent. Yet you're going to take it down here because of your sin. And it's going to be killed because you have sinned. Now, part of the law of being a schoolmaster to bring us into Christ was continually, year by year, caused them to realize that it should have focused them in on when is that Savior coming, and they should have understood the nature of the Savior. But, of course, they had a false concept of his kingdom, of themselves, of the law of Moses, at least overall in general. And yet, we're seeing here in the blood of Christ what a marvelous picture of love in sacrifice. The contrast that's in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 12, very clearly and vividly attests to the supremacy of the gospel sacrificial system when you compare and contrast it with Judaism. It's the new and living way that's provided by the Lamb of God, John 1, And then again, he writes about it in Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 20. And, of course, the law then was a shadow of the real item to come. And the writer of Hebrews helps us a lot in understanding the law of Moses and the process of correcting those Jews who are trying to depart from the faith. We have a better understanding of how to approach the study of the Old Testament by knowing what's taught in the, in the book of Hebrews. So from the time of John the forerunner of the Christ of the Jews, John the Immerser, when he was crying out in his work, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world, John 129. Until we can say the writing in Hebrews 13, 20, we see attention, our attention called to the great shepherd of the sheep and the blood of the everlasting covenant. And we can only thank God for such love. I suggest your private devotions that you continue to pursue the study about what the Bible says about the love of God. And we'll better understand the shed blood of Jesus Christ and what God gave up that we could be saved. We didn't deserve any of it. Thus, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Thank you.